Uh, can you all, maybe you think, can you just say something or play a music, whatever, so that I can hear you as well? Because uh, you can hear me, but I might not be able to hear because my, my, my headphones may not be working. Good morning, sir. Can you hear me? Uh, good, thank you. I can hear you already. Good, huh? So, the, my headphones are working. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, 57 of you. So, I think this, uh, uh, maybe I'll just wait for one minute for the rest to come in in case they are taking a short break uh, uh, from Dr. Lam's class before joining this class. Okay. Uh, while waiting, are there any questions from the previous lecture on the heuristics? Just to double check. No? Okay. Uh, how do you find Dr. Lam's class? I think on the uh, basically latex. Uh, yeah, I think the uh, why, uh, light, light latex is it. Uh, I used latex uh, 20 years ago, uh, but I stopped using because at the time, you don't have the uh, user interface like what Dr. Lam showed you. So I had to do everything uh, like a program. I, and then I compile it using the latex compiler. So now I can see that it's much more user-friendly. So I think you basically, with the latex, you just focus on just typing up your project report or your um, dissertation notices. And then the latex will compile for you, arrange everything nicely for you. So about uh, all those uh, minor, minor things. Uh, so it's, I think, much more user-friendly. Yeah, correct. Especially for the uh, mathematics, uh, you find that uh, in Word, if you want to insert an equation, it can be very painful. And also on, on, on top of that, there's also the other part, which is the list of uh, references. Huh? So if you change any references, you will reorder references, you'll do everything again, which is very painful. So in this latex, uh, as I understand, you can actually just, uh, you can re resort, reorder your list of references and then the, the, the previous paragraphs or previous chapters will actually automatically Rearrange for you, so it's actually uh, easier, much more easier. Now, just to double check, uh, how's the sound quality? Is it too loud, too soft? I, I'm going to increase the sound a little bit uh, to 54%, so maybe it's uh, better now. Good, okay, uh, thank you, Chung Yi. I think uh, we have about 70 students now, so it should be all right. Uh, the reason why I want to check with you because I, I got myself a new toy, I call it, I got myself a new uh, set of heads. So, Hopefully, it's uh, much more comfortable and also uh, uh, lighter. So I, when I conduct lectures for two, three hours, uh, at least uh, it won't be so hot. Okay, let's get started. So if there are no questions, let's start on today's uh, new topic. Uh, this will be on the rule-based expert system. So the previous uh, two lectures on the introduction to search and then the heuristics is on one topic, which is the, basically on how do you, uh, why do you want to search and how do you do search searching for uh, better solutions, searching for uh, an optimal solution. <clears throat> so uh, now we're going to go on to another topic, which is expert system. So this will be on the rule-based expert system. So this will probably be about this week and the next week, we will do that. Yes, so the learning outcomes. At the end of this uh, lecture, of this topic, what do you hope to learn? So the first few parts will talk about introduction, and then we look about uh, basically what is knowledge. So we spend some time looking at what is knowledge and then to define what is knowledge. And you have knowledge because uh, you look at it that basically when you want to develop an artificial system which represents your expert. Yes, because at the end of the day, we want to replicate or duplicate the human expert because there's only not enough, uh, let's put it this way, not enough experts, human experts. So we want to copy that uh, human expert into an artificial form. Right? So I think that's one simple way of uh, uh, explaining the motivation behind 
developing such expert systems. So and then the expert system, as you as you may realize, can work uh, twenty four hours a day without any rest. That is the artificial system. So uh, that's the one of the motivation for that. So when you want to duplicate, replicate the human expert, how do you do that? What is the main thing that you want to duplicate or replicate? That is the person's knowledge that is very unique to the expert, right? So how do you represent that person, the human person's uh, knowledge or expertise? So we use the set of rules right, to represent the knowledge. So we want to look at how rules can be used as a knowledge representation technique. We we'll spend some time looking at that. Now, once we've done that, we want to see how we, we what are the things we need to do, who are the people we need to do in developing the expert system. So who are the main players in the, in the development team of the expert system? And then uh, we will also spend some time looking at the structure of such a rule-based expert system. What are the major components that is uh, needed to uh, develop, right? Uh, produce such a rule-based expert system. And then the we also want the next part. We also want to look at the after developing the expert system. What is the common or familiar characteristics of such an expert system? So that joy thing that no right we have blood a similar characteristic of an expert system. And the next part is that we will get to so that you chain and what what differences and then the uh the person but when you use coaching, when you use backward chaining, we also spend some time to understand, to go through, uh, I think, the two case studies, uh, one for forward chain and the other for backward chain. I mean, we don't want to let go the resolution. So, to me, by reference, click the uh, rule. The rule is actually. Uh, Point or result, picking or very close to the con. So, how will this be for if the people Your voice is lagging. Ah, uh, that's why I think they're yeah, hang on, uh, lagging again. Um, uh, um, I think it's okay. Uh, thank you for what I did. Uh, try to do uh, Try to do that in a minute. Thank you. How is it now? Can you uh, hear me? Okay, uh, first I, I switch to a different, uh, what do you call it? Different, uh, I, I have now two systems. Uh, hang on. I need to get this back. Okay, so. No, I, I use uh, I use wireless. <laughs> so now I have to hook on to the DG and then hook on to a uh, yeah, network. So I have two networks here uh, running because I uh, because uh, I think I think the earlier one cannot uh, support right cannot support the 
the load I would say because uh, I think you, you all know that uh, especially when it when it's a uh, I notice when it's a cloudy day uh, <laughs> I always have problems I think network is not not so uh, good now where am I okay forward chaining backward chaining so we have uh, looking at the two of the common methods that you use for the uh, use for expert terms which is called forward chaining and backward chaining then the I think I was uh, looking at the conflict resolution so what happens if the expert system points or result in asking you to do things which does uh, on one hand ask you to turn left and then at the same time also ask you to turn right right so that one to us is very confusing what are you trying to tell me I, am i supposed to turn right or am i supposed to turn left this is a simple example so that is what it meant by conflict so the the two the rules are uh, in a way correct as uh, defined by the uh, maybe the knowledge engineer in the expert system they try to see who who they are but somehow the two rules actually are, are are both correct and wrong in wrong the sense that they actually result in uh, the conclusion which actually uh, are in, is in conflict with another rule uh, with, with, it will become clearer as, as we look at this uh, last part here right so these are the main things you we hope that uh, we will learn at the out at the end of this uh, lecture of this topic now let's look at the first one first huh? let's talk about the uh, what is knowledge right so this one is actually taken from the the recommended textbook by uh, professor Nevinsky. and this is about uh, looking at knowledge knowledge is a theoretical or practical understanding right so it can be both theory as well as practice of your understanding of a subject so it's actually very narrow in the sense that it is on a subject right or a domain so you have uh, knowledge on AI, your knowledge on mathematics, your knowledge on digital logic circuits, your knowledge on cooking. So it's very specific to that domain of a subject. Knowledge is also the sum of what is currently known. So it is the total sum of what is known of that topic or that subject or that domain. And uh, for some people, um, or rather many people believe that knowledge is power because you, I know something that you don't so it, that gives me a sense of uh, power I'm more powerful than you in that sense huh? so those who possess such knowledge are called experts they try we will we'll look at it again huh? more closely uh, so if you possess the knowledge of course you will be called expert of course the level of your knowledge can be different like so you can have a very uh, senior expert or junior expert or fresh expert so that will be different levels uh, of experts anyone can be considered so anyone can be considered a domain expert that means expert in that area if he or she has a deep knowledge now we come to this definition now a bit clearer now has some deep knowledge so it's not just superficial not uh, shallow knowledge but deep knowledge including both the facts and the rules that means the facts will be uh, i think we don't facts will be uh, the fact is the sky is blue the rules means that if the sky is blue uh, it is possible it is a po uh, probably you don't need to bring an umbrella for the next one hour or so that means that it will not rain all those are the rules eh? and also the domain expert other than the deep knowledge uh, it's also expected to have some strong practical experience in that particular domain so it's just not a theoretician you just are not just what you call just talk huh? like we say in, in, in the in the uh, in the uh, in, 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 in real life uh, you just don't talk you must be able to show that you can do it so you cannot be just talking about uh, uh, cooking you must be able to show that you are able to cook able to, to, to repair a car right and also uh, other things uh, so this is in that particular domain so you must have some practical experience furthermore the area of the domain may be limited so uh, your knowledge can be limited means very narrow right so you only know about cooking you don't know about repairing cars or you know about repairing cars you don't know about uh, cooking 
So in general, an expert, so this is a summary here. Yeah? In general, who is an expert? The expert is a skillful person, skillful because of the practical experience who can do things other people cannot. Right, so of course, uh, if you say I can fry an egg, huh? just uh, fry an egg. So you, you cannot claim to expert because frying an egg is actually, yes, you have the skill of frying an egg, but then uh, most other people also can fry an egg or cook, cook rice. So it must be something more than that other people cannot do. So that's what, what is, uh, I mean, there's a proper definition uh, of, of expert. And this is also very important uh, for those of you who want to, who will be embarking, who will be starting your FIP very soon, uh, or if not started. Because when you want to uh, develop your systems, actually, I think, I think all, if not most of you, because I, I saw the list of uh, projects uh, that uh, uh, you all are undertaking, and I understand that uh, Dr. Tan has, uh, has actually sent out the notification that your project title has been moderated. And then he's also advising you to go and talk to your supervisor to actually maybe start working on your project. If yes, also suggestions for changes uh, to the uh, project title. So when you start do building your intelligence system or you're building your artificial system, Right, so again, uh, you need to talk to an expert. You need to tell the person, ask the person that who you actually uh, identify as your domain expert. Right, so uh, example, if I want to build a car uh, diagnostic system, that means that my artificial system can help to identify what is wrong with your car engine. <clears throat> then the question is, who do I talk to as an expert? So you need to talk to the right person who's good at repairing cars. Maybe a common, common sense will tell you that you talk to a person who has maybe many years of experience working in as, as a mechanic. So that, was, that is the domain expert. So same thing applies to you. So one of the difficulties of your FIP would be when you want to, especially when you do want to build an expert system, right? when you want to build such an intelligent system, is to identify the expert who you have talked to. <clears throat> okay, for example, one of my uh, students is working on the redness detection to detect the redness. Uh, uh, of course, we want to find the optimal redness of the palm oil fruits. So when the red, when the palm oil fruit is is uh, uh, right at the optimal level, we expect that uh, fruit to give us the highest amount of palm oil, right? Because uh, you don't want to have it uh, unripe. That means there's not much oil there. So it's a waste of effort because you need to send people to harvest the fruits. <clears throat> so we need to know what is the right time to uh, harvest your uh, palm oil fruit. So for that, uh, by looking at the color, so we want to build a system to, by looking at the color of the fruits. But of course, after looking at the color of the fruit, it doesn't mean anything to us, right? Because we don't know how ripe is the fruit. Yes, it's red in color, but my question is, so what, right? Is it ripe enough or not, not ripe at all? So the, the thing is, the challenge is for us to find the optimal ripeness. When is the fruit at its peak and not also overripe, right? So the same thing also, for example, goes to your durian, right? I think. I think some of you may be looking at uh, maybe looking at the durian ripeness uh, detection system, right? Because if it's not right, it won't be so sweet. So that uh, you know, uh, sometimes it, uh, it's it's so hard, uh, and right. If it's too right, it can go uh, have a uh, it can not taste so well, so good. Right? Uh, for some, those of you who are, would like to eat durian, you know that if the fruit is overripe, it can get watery. It can also have a a bit of a, okay, different flavor, the, 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 the thing will, will, will change. So you don't want to do that. So you need to be able to talk to that expert. So you have to find the expert to what we call the, finding out what is the equivalent uh, level of that. Uh, in my case, it's object uh, with the palm oil fruits. I, I show to you this color of the palm oil fruit. You, can you tell me what is the level of redness of this palm oil fruit? or durian for that matter. 
Uh, so you need to talk to that uh, expert. So you need to identify and talk to experts. And later on, you see that uh, it's not so simple as that. Huh? Uh, it's, uh, later on, you see that. So the so we are again again keep in mind uh, what we are trying to do here. We are trying to identify, right? Uh, trying to build uh, artificial expert. Uh, if, if, if I may use the word, uh, so this is what we call expert system. So we want to copy the expertise in the human into a uh, uh, the machine. So we want to look at your how the human solve problems. So the human mental process, right? We use our brain to 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 solve a problem, to understand and to solve a problem. The human mental process, unfortunately, is internal inside our brain. And it's and actually uh, it is believed that it is also too complex to be represented as just an algorithm. So can you, can you represent the human mental process as just an equation, right? It's too complex. However, all is not lost. As, um, if you talk to the experts, uh, most experts are capable of expressing their knowledge in the form of rules or problem solving. So we come back to again, this is, uh, I can see also, I think in the past few tutorials I've, I've uh, conducted, I find that some of you actually looking at the outputs, right? looking at the systems, right? the output of AI. So it's not, so we are talking about how do we now represent, how do we capture the knowledge of the experts so that I can now build that knowledge into the system. So you will need to be able to interview talk to the experts, your identified experts, to <clears throat> ask them, what, what, what do I do, right? So, um, so we want, want to do that, right? So, um, so although what we know is actually inside our brain, and as, um, unless you talk to them, you cannot, uh, uh, so I think the challenge is how to represent what we know inside like our brain. Right, the mental process. So the, the best way to do that is you talk to them, interview them, and then ask them to tell you uh, uh, what they know, and then you then you then uh, generate or form their knowledge into a set of rules for such problem solving. So I, it's very important that uh, you find later on also. Uh, in the next maybe two, three lectures, you'll find that there's one of the common ways of building um, artificial systems based on rules. So here, you can see down here, you can see down here, we have a set of rules here to represent a certain, uh, to maybe to represent uh, Driving instructor, uh, you may use the word driving instructor it means that someone teaches us how to drive. So if you talk to the person, you tell me that if the traffic light is green, right? And it, I think this is also universal. That means that uh, uh, in all countries, uh, if I may say so, <laughs> when you see traffic light is green, you go, right? And on the other hand, okay, this is one sort of user, it's one set of knowledge. So if you see the light is green you press your accelerator and you proceed to drive. If the traffic light is red, what happens? Right, if the traffic light is red, you should stop. Now again, uh, there's this joke about the uh, traffic light is red, uh, I think in Malaysia, uh, this, this joke that uh, for, for, uh, for some of us, uh, we, we laugh at this thing. Uh, I think uh, if the traffic light is red, uh, for some of us actually, uh, um, if you press on the accelerator more, so you try to beat the traffic light. <laughs> As I said, uh, this is a joke. Uh. <laughs> Don't take me seriously here. So this is uh, this is the other the other official rule you capture from the driving instructor. So there are two rules here, and I can see here: the green, you go; red, you stop. That's how you capture the information from the driving instructor. So clearly, you see that uh, what we are trying to do here is to use rules as a uh, form of as a form of uh, 
knowledge representation technique. So the come back to the term rule in such knowledge representation. Now the term, the rule itself in AI, which is the most commonly used type of knowledge representation. So this is the uh, most commonly used. So you have to build your knowledge in the form of rules. Can be defined as the as an if then structure. Very simple. The rule in AI is actually just the if then structure <coughs> that relates to uh, relates the given information. That means that what you are uh, given information you give if the red if the light is uh, green you go right so if the light is green so this is a uh, given information or facts in the if part so the if part if the traffic light is green that is the uh, first part that when you put inside the if uh, part of your uh, uh, of your um, structure of your represent of your expert system then is the then you do something which is the action part in the then part. So the first part is your information. The second part, then part is your action part. You do something, action. So therefore, you can clearly see that a rule provides some description of how to solve a problem. So problem here in this case, in this example, will be how to drop by. And one of the advantages of the rules is that it is relatively easy to create and understand. <clears throat> right? Uh, the rules are easy to create, but then uh, easy also has some uh, has also had its own uh, drawbacks, have its own limit, uh, at its own disadvantage, as you'll see later on huh? in the next few slides. <clears throat> so any rule in such a knowledge representation technique has basically two parts: the if part. Let me see if this works or not. Huh? Doesn't work. Okay. Uh, the antecedent or the premise also condition. So you have uh, the if part. Uh, if you don't like to call it if part, it's also known as uh, antecedent part, the premise part, or the condition part. And then following that, the then part. Now the then part is known as your consequent, conclusion, or the action part. So those are the, uh, the two parts of your rule in AI or to represent knowledge, to build your system, to build your intelligent system, right? So we have an antecedent, which is actually the if part, and then the consequent, which is the then part. If you were to uh, write it down again here, you find that if is an antecedent, and then the then is your consequence. Now, furthermore, a rule can have multiple antecedents. That means that this part here is not only just one, right? If something, then something, right? Then do something. So that if part, the antecedent part, can be, can have, it can be multiple, not just one, huh? as you shown late, uh, down here. <clears throat> and then how are they joined? They are joined by the keywords. N. Uh, now you can see N actually uh, for all of you, you. You've seen this, you come across this uh, N uh, term in your uh, early years, uh, in, especially in the digital logic circuits. And then the O. Now, another name for N is actually conjunction. Another one is actually O, which is disjunction or a combination of both. Uh, normally, these are the common ones. Huh? Normally, uh, there's also uh, you don't normally use uh, the man or the nor or the invert huh? or the uh, invert of, of the of the fact. Huh? So normally we use just and or or um, conjunction. So um, we will see that later on huh? in the next few slides. <clears throat> also can be combination. So here you look at the first. Uh, ah, on this left hand side here, it's actually on the using the conjunction form of uh, multiple. Antecedents. This part here on the right hand side, uses the the disjunction or the all function. So this one is a, is a 
you see here, I have multiple now, I have multiple antecedents, antecedent one, antecedent two, antecedent n. So there are n antecedents. So if you see, uh, basically, if you see all, all these conditions being met, then you do something. Then only have one consequence, right? You don't have a, a multiple antecedents and multiple consequence, right? So each rule can only have one consequence. If I see all these things here, I will only do this, right? And this is something also, uh, it's also part of your assignment later on. Uh, uh, which actually uh, I have announced, I have, pro I have a share with you. So you have to, for example, if I see these particular things, I will say this one belongs to grade A or grade B. Uh, uh, this is a grade A durian, this is a, or grade B durian. Uh, the same thing applies for those of you, for I think one of you actually uh, want to do a durian classification system. Right, so uh, what are the major characteristics of a uh, Musan King, for example, right? So you see the Musan King have, have these features, feature one. If uh, if this durian has this feature and this feature and this feature are up to you to de decide. Of course, uh, not up to you in the sense that uh, you decide freely, but you have to talk to the expert, which is a uh, domain, ex domain, uh, domain expert, right? The, the person who knows uh, how, how you identify the Musan King, for example. So here, if you see all this, then you say this is a Musan King. Now, on the other hand, you can also try out using the disjunction function, which is an all function. If this, uh, if this, uh, this antecedent is true, or this antecedent is true, so uh, then you say this is a durian. But if anything, so, so for example, if the uh, the, uh, the the object is uh, has tons, or the object has a certain uh, strong, uh, like a strong uh, taste or smell, then this is a durian. So this is your consequence. So you can see here, you can just either one of these, or it can be, you use end here and then you can use all the other side. Uh, in one of the rules. So the rules are quite flexible. I think that there's a message here. The uh, the rules here for the expert system can be quite uh, flexible for you to uh, design. <clears throat> so again, we are saying that, uh, now what, what are the other uh, major important characteristics of your uh, rules. So here you can see that the antecedent part of the rule, the first part of the rule, which is the if part, right, uh, has a uh, object, which is what we call the linguistic object huh, and its value, right? And so later on, we will become clearer what you mean by object or linguistic object, which, which is the proper uh, term and a value. Now the object or the linguistic object and the value and its value are linked by an operator. So these these two parts here, the ob linguistic object and the value, are linked by an operator. <clears throat> now what's the function of this operator? The operator identifies the object, identifies the linguistic object, and then assigns the value to it. Now such operators linking the two parts here, object and the value, uh, are such as is, are, is not. Uh, this is your invert idea. This is your uh, invert. Are uh, not, plural, right? And these uh, operators are used to assign a symbolic value to a linguistic object. So as it will then, uh, this operator will link up uh, the linguistic object and, the, and then assign it to a value, right? So we will assign this uh, value, which is also known as a symbolic value, to the linguistic of, right, of, of that uh, first part, only for the first part uh, of, the, of the rule. Experts, furthermore, expert system can also use mathematical operators. They can also use mathematical operators. Uh, it's uh, less than, more than, equals to, what else? Huh? Equals to more than huh? things like that. Mathematical operators think that some of these common mathematical operators to define an object as numerical and assign it to the numerical value, as shown uh, in the next in the in the next few lines down here. So this is actually the ruler uh, that we actually maybe extracted from the banking officer. So the banker 
the identified as the expert in the banking industry. So you talk to the expert. How can a young person uh, uh, withdraw money if the uh, uh, if we draw a large amount of money. So here, if you look at the first part, uh, the antecedent. So you can see here, consists of three parts here. So the first part is your linguistic object, which is the age of the customer. So this is your linguistic operator, linguistic object. And then the value is actually 18 here. So this is a LinkedIn, and that is linked to linked together using the operator, which is the uh, using this mathematical operator, which is less than. So if your object is uh, less than, the age of the customer is less than 18. So this is your linguistic object, age of the customer. So what is the age of the customer? And then the uh, value is 18. And then it's connected or linked with uh, this uh, mathematical operator less than. Right? So this is the first part of your uh, antecedent. As we said before, the antecedent can have multiple, you can have multiple antecedents, not only one, right? You can, for example, if you use one, if the age of the customer is less than 18, then you say, uh, then you do this, right? So uh, it's not so uh, useful, if I may say so, useful, because if you just say that uh, regardless if you withdraw one ringgit, 50 cents or 10,000 ringgit, right? You still need the signature of your parent, so it's not so, uh, I would say, friendly, user friendly to the to the for your that particular application, which is to get people, young people, to withdraw money, right? So in this case, we said that no, it's not good enough. So therefore, I want to include another one, another antecedent, which is uh, if the cash amount, if the cash withdrawal again, this is your second uh, linguistic object, right? Now, if the cash withdrawal the amount you want to withdraw is more than one thousand ringgit, right? If one thousand, if you if your amount you want to withdraw is more than one thousand, then your consequent now. This is your last part of your rule uh, for the expert system. So then, if these two conditions are met, then you need to get the signature of a parent, right? This is the signature of parent. So this is what you so can see that this is actually. I'm now replacing the banker with such a system. So here you can see that uh, the two parts here. So this both of these must be satisfied. So of course the reverse is uh, of course the reverse is if the customer is older, more than uh, more than equals 15 years old, and or uh, mother, so you don't need to have a signature parent. So this only applies to young customers, which is less than 18 years old. And on top of that, the young customer wants to withdraw uh, more than 1,000. Now, if the young customer wants to withdraw less than 1,000 or less than equals 1,000 ringgit, uh, you do not need the customer, the young customer, to get any signature from the parent. So again, you can see I'm now replacing the banker with such a system to advise you what to do. Right? So maybe the system will say uh, I, I, you have to identify yourself. What's your age? How much are you withdrawing? So the system will say if you, if you meet this con if you fulfill these two conditions, I will want you to show me proof of your parent signature author authorization. If not, I will let you withdraw. Right? So you can see it's actually very uh, user friendly and useful. <clears throat> Furthermore, rules can also represent relations, recommendations, directives, strategy, and heuristics. Now these are actually the type of applications when you want to use such a uh, expert system using those rules is to tell you the relationship between the the what you see and then what 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 happens next recommendation right so recommendation is i think uh, you, you see the next few next few lines down here directive strategies and heuristics now let's look at the first one which is a relation right so relation is that if your fuel tank is the antecedent, if the, this is the object and this is your value, is uh, this is your operator member, we saw what operator is R and things like that, right? Is empty. So if the fuel tank is empty, the consequence is the car is dead. That means the car cannot move. Right? So 
What else do you see here, which may not be uh, very obvious to you? What else do you see here? The rules themselves, as shown here, are very readable, right? By reading at the rules, you know what the rules are telling you. So it's one of those uh, advantages of using rules to represent uh, uh, the knowledge for such intelligent systems. Now let's look at the second one, second example of the rules. Where are the rules? What, what the rules can do? The rules can also be used as a recommendation. Now what does it mean? So for example here, in this uh, example, in this rule, which consists of three antecedents, or the, uh, the parts, uh, the antecedent part, if part, yes. Um, if the season's autumn, so that we know that uh, in those uh, temperate uh, countries, you have four seasons, autumn, winter, spring, and summer. So we know that uh, what's the season at this, at, at this point in time. Now, if the season is autumn, then on, in addition, and the sky is cloudy, right? this is your object, linguistic object, this is operator, and this is the value. So you look at the sky, is, is the sky cloudy? And if the sky is cloudy and now what else? Then you also rely on the uh, forecast. What does the radio, what does the TV forecast whether man tells you or whether woman tells you? The forecast is today it will uh, be, uh, have a light rain, which is a drizzle. Then your system here will tell you, please take an umbrella, right? So this is a consequence. Then the advice is take an umbrella. So this one will be useful if you for, for those uh, maybe the way travelers, right? Especially if you are new to a country, what do I do? So these are things you need to, uh, uh, maybe maybe these are things you need to, maybe this is the system you need to conduct when I go out before going up. So this system will recommend you to take an umbrella. Now stronger than, um, stronger than a recommendation is a directive. That means directive tell you, you must do this. It's no longer a uh, uh, recommendation, right? It, 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 as you see why in the next few lines here. If the car is dead, right? So the antecedent is that you find that the car is uh, cannot start, it's dead. Then check. And if the car is dead and the fuel tank is empty, so you, uh, the car is dead, then you check your fuel tank. Does it, does it have petrol inside your fuel tank? So the fuel tank is empty, it doesn't have petrol. Then, Action is refill the car. You see that difference here? So this one actually is telling you that if you want the car to move, you should at least try to refill the car. Right? It's no longer a recommendation tell that please take umbrella. So you have to at least do this in order for the car to at least uh, maybe uh, to move huh? so the car can still move because the future is empty. Right? Of course, this is, uh, you look at it closely, it's actually not the, uh, at the end of the day, even if you refill the car, the car may not start because it so happens that uh, 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 so happens that your fuel is empty. But the problem actually is not in the uh, not the problem with the fuel. It means something else. But at least uh, this one will tell you as, as a start, right? So this is something you need to do first. So it's a directive. So example now. Now what about what about strategy? What's the strategy? So this is an example of a strategy, and this is actually consists of two parts. You see here. So this is the first set of rules, and this is the second set of rules. Now step one, step two. Now step one is, uh, if the car is dead, so your system will check if, if the car cannot start, right? Then of course, the in this case, uh, if you look at it, it's a recommendation. If the car cannot start, please check the fuel tank. Is the fuel, is the fuel tank empty or full? Is there petrol inside your, your uh, fuel tank of your car? So you are supposed to do this. So this is a strategy. Now, after completing this first step, now the fuel, the fuel tank is no longer empty, right? Or maybe your fuel tank is not empty, so the car is still dead, then after checking this, then you go next step. Now, after you have the first step completed, then uh, you, uh, this is actually an uh, uh, extension of your first step. Huh? So, and the fuel tank is now full, or maybe half full, or at least not empty. Huh? Then, if the car still cannot start, Right, you check your battery. Uh, you see, it's so actually, it's also it's by a series of elimination. This system will tell you what to do, so you can see that it's actually um, something that uh, is useful 
as a thought, uh, maybe it is something that we can so uh, have it built uh, uh, inside your new car, so that uh, if these things happen, it's, uh, you don't have to contact the or uh, call up the mechanic. So this one will tell you what to do, right? And also, if you want to go one step further, right, you can also have sensors inside your expensive car, and then the expensive car will tell you, right? Uh, uh, when you start starting the car, cannot start. Then you say, oh, fuel tank is empty. So you check for you using the right sensors. And I, uh, for those uh, uh, high-end cars, uh, you can see that also uh, sometimes uh, uh, we tell you also we have sensors nowadays uh, to your tires. to tell you if the tire puncture, if the tire is air, you know, or puncture, uh, please slow down or please stop at the side, things like that. So this is what we call a strategy. So this is, yeah, by doing all this, I will tell you what to do so that your car can still move and not dead. What about heuristic? This is a uh, sort of a common sense, if you like that common sense, we just studied this uh, in the last lecture on the heuristic search. Now, in this example, uh, our heuristic, if the spill, that means that uh, water liquid on the, on the floor, spill, uh, the, the, the liquid is spilled on the floor, it's a liquid, right? It is spilled, so this is your ob object, and this is your operator, and this is your value. So is the spill a liquid? And the spill, then you of course somehow need to be able to measure what is the pH value of your liquid of the spill liquid on the floor. Is it less than six? And does the spill smell? That means that there must be a smell sensor uh, that can tell you what is the smell of that uh, liquid. Is it vinegar? Does it smell like vinegar? Then if this is true, it tell you that probably the liquid itself is acetic acid. So it's also, also useful for you to detect um, some sort of a colorless liquid. Remember, uh, the vinegar itself is colorless, so it looks just like uh, uh, water, right? Just plain water. What else does this tell you? This also tells you that, I think most of us know that because we have learned through the years, but at the same time, we also what can also con consult the expert in such things, huh? uh, maybe a chemist or chemical engineer will tell you that the vinegar is or acetic acid, right? Uh, has a is it, is a liquid. It is a pH is less than six, and it all, always smells uh, like vinegar. So that was actually acetic acid. This, this, all this rule itself, or this heuristic itself, is actually compiled, developed by after talking to the after consulting the expert, the domain expert in chemical or chemistry. So now, after understanding the structure of the uh, what what we mean by knowledge, how to represent knowledge, and then the rules, how you actually build the rules, and what are the major uh, characteristics or components of the rule, now we come to the next part, which is how do you then develop or build your uh, expert system. So this is the uh, the uh, the old way of uh, I think the old way of uh, suggested old way of uh, building your expert system consisting of five members. So your uh, expert system should have five members. That is, first of all, uh, this is your domain expert. Now, the domain expert itself, uh, as I see, uh, may not be something, somebody permanent. So it can be on and off like a consultant. You consult the domain expert. So in, in our earlier example, this will be your chemist or your chemical engineer, someone who actually has a knowledge, has a vast knowledge or deep knowledge in uh, chemistry, right? So again, this I can also say that this is actually your, in a way, similar to your FIP. You also need to have a, engage a domain expert. Then you have the knowledge engineer, the second one. The third one is a programmer. So you need to uh, uh, program, uh, develop the program or your expert system Right, build that from this uh, knowledge. And of course, you have also your project manager, someone who takes uh, charge of the whole project and know that and checks on you, or checks on the, uh, the rest, uh, whether that project is on, on, on time or actually behind schedule. And of course, the last one will be the end user. Who is your end user? And again, from experience, you, you know that uh, you cannot live without these two guys. The domain expert and the end user. Let me explain why. 
the domain expert, uh, go back to an example of uh, uh, intelligent uh, durian, uh, one Musang King uh, uh, identification uh, right, system. So because I think it's also important because nowadays I understand that, uh, you know, everyone claims to be selling Musang King. But uh, of course, why, why do you do that? Because Musang King fetches a high price. Of course, if you're low grade durian, Kampong durian, you pretend it is a Busan King, you can fetch four or five times the price, right? Then how do the you and me, huh? uh, ordinary person, ordinary people, uh, I tend to know that this is a real Musan King or not a Musan King. So that one is also, I think there may be a market for that huh? to actually have a system for that. So now currently you just you just trust, you have to trust the durian seller that tells you this is a Musan King and charge you. 60, 65 ringgit, for example, uh, per kilogram. Whereas actually, the, the durian is actually not Musang King. It actually is uh, uh, only fetches something like uh, 15 ringgit per kilogram. Uh, so you can see the, the price difference. Huh? So the other one is, of course, the end user. Uh, you also need to understand, right? At the end of the day, your system cannot be developed based on what you, uh, as a programmer, for example, wants. You have to fulfill the needs of your customer, which is very important. Huh? So someone said before, uh, I think uh, uh, the customer is king. Right? So this is your end user. So you need to talk to the end user. What do you want? Especially for those of you who are working on the industry projects. Huh? That means that you really have a customer, right? The customer sponsors your project. That means that he or she, the, co the company will pay for your expenses, your equipment, right? things you need to buy. And things I need to, uh, to, to, to build, right? So the customer will actually uh, pay for you, right? For, for that. So you need to talk to the person. You can't simply uh, cook up what you think the customer wants, right? So, uh, so because uh, I think you have seen, uh, maybe I'll, I'll show it next day. Uh, I, I think that I, some of you have, may have seen the very nice uh, cartoon uh, of. Uh, picture of that uh, the customer actually wants a, a I think a, a swing right and then you end up building uh, something else I think I'll share with you later on uh, this is very important because you'll find that uh, and although it seems simple enough what the end user wants uh, uh, but first you have to talk to them and again this is okay very uh, can be time consuming because you need to spend time to actually find the time of your customer, talk to the person, talk to that customer. So uh, customer may not be free all the time. So you have to find, find the time to match his time or her time. So, um, and then you also need to ask the right questions because we cannot ask the right questions and you end up doing something else. So again, you can see if you be a successful uh, AI engineer, I'm using the word AI engineer in a very generic sense. Huh? You also need to be able to communicate well. That means ask the right person, talk to the person, right? And then uh, and be also, I think in a way, also be patient because you need to ask a lot of questions, right? And of course, uh, the end user customer may not be free. So if you spend you know, three, four hours uh, talking to you, you know, three, four hours, he won't be able to do work, right? That's all. So you might to be able to quickly ask the right questions and then in the least amount of time so that you can do your job uh, to develop that expert system. So you can see here in the next part, very clearly, right? It's very uh, obvious, your expert system, the success of your expert system entirely depends on how well the members work together. So you need to be, you also need to have some uh, personal skills, right? To, especially for a project manager, to manage the team and to manage the various parties involved in your expert system. <clears throat> okay, so at the uh, highest level, uh, as, a, as a figure, this is how the, uh, with the arrow showing that uh, the interaction between your expert system development team. So this is how your system should look like. You have at the top here, the project manager, which oversees all the major uh, team members of the system of your expert system over here that you're trying to build. And also the expert system, uh, project manager also need to, to liaise or talk to the end user and the end user, of course, need to liaise with project manager. So the project manager 
maybe the you can see here the domain expert and the programmer need not talk to the end user. So this is your customer. Because that customer should know what he or she wants. And that is related, that is uh, re related or uh, relied to the uh, that is communicated to the project manager. Uh, relate, uh, relate to the project manager. And the project manager will then uh, communicate to the other uh, to the actual team itself, uh, the team members, which is only engineer and the programmer. Uh, now, question now is that although it's not shown here, you can see here the there is no uh, what do you call it? There is no. Uh, this is actually the the blue box here. It's actually your expert system development team. Outside the box is your expert system and your end user. But notice that there is no. Uh, communication path between the knowledge engineer and your program uh, programmer and also the end users. But, some, but sometimes it's also good to include, right, when you call for a meeting, to include the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the knowledge engineer programmer to listen at first hand to the end user. Although, uh, the, if you are a knowledge engineer here and you have a very tight deadline, uh, you say, why am I wasting my time listening to the end user? Which can be you know quite kind of, but it's also good, right? Because you see, uh, what the end user wants, again back to communication. What the end user wants is communicated to the project manager, and of, of course, uh, if you look at the uh, real world communication systems, there's always a uh, information loss, right? What is transmitted here? Maybe a small percentage, maybe one or two percent, maybe uh, will be lost, uh, will not be transmitted across to the project manager. Now, when the project manager again communicates with the knowledge engineer, with his team members, again, as a, in a non ideal, non perfect system, there will be some information loss. So, even though it's two percent, two percent of two percent actually is, is small, but it's still information loss. One, one, one round. So, after many rounds, you find that. Uh, so, so uh, if you're a good project manager, wise project manager, maybe you want to also include the uh, your your team members uh, to the end user. And I think I see some of you are actually starting to leave the room. I think you have, some of you may have classes after this, so I think uh, also time for me to stop and I'll continue uh, in the on Friday morning. If it's okay, right? So, uh, any other questions? If not, uh, do we stop? Do we stop here. Okay. Uh, so, uh, bye bye, and see you. I think uh, tomorrow they have, we have a lab, isn't it? Or lab with uh, some of you. Otherwise, uh, I'll see you guys on Friday. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you, sir.